Tonight we're going to look at a topic that really upsets the devil a lot. It's one that he has much displeasure with, but one that is very vital to one's Christian experience. I want us to begin tonight by looking at a passage in the 28th chapter of Matthew. This passage is often referred to as the Gospel Commission. Um, sometimes it's even referred to as the 11th Commandment. But take a look at what Jesus said in Matthew 28, <clears throat> verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So there's a promise, but there's also a command in this um, statement of Jesus. He says to go and teach everybody, all nations, once they have been taught to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's much uh, controversy on that today because there are certain groups of people who say, oh, you should only baptize in the name of Jesus. But if that be the case, then why would Jesus say what he said here? So this is the words of Jesus directly. You baptize them, and then what do you do after you baptize them? What does it say there? You keep teaching. So a person's teaching does not end with baptism because the learning experience with God does not end in our entire life. We spend our life learning the things of God and you teach them whatsoever things I commanded you. Now today there are many, many types of baptism in the world. Some churches, they baptize by sprinkling a little few drops of water. Some pour water infusion. Um, I know of one church, the pastor uses rose petals. I read it once a few years ago about another pastor of a well-known denomination, and he lined them up outside the building of the church, the church building, and took the water hose to them. Some baptize with salt. And one pastor, he baptizes simply by laying his hand upon the head of the person and saying, I baptize you. That might be called the dry cleaning method. No water at all, you see. So there's all of these different forms. And one that I did not mention that we'll look at in depth tonight is by immersion. And we'll see that that's exactly what the word baptize means. But with all of these different types of baptism, all of these different ideas, how do we find the truth in this confused world? Again, we found each time that we've studied that we find the truth from the word of God. Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So when we want to know the truth about anything, the place to go is to the word of God. And in the Bible, we find that baptism is mentioned 80 times in the New Testament. 80 references to baptism. One of the first I want us to consider tonight is found in Ephesians chapter 4. And notice what Jesus says through the Apostle Paul. He says, there is one Lord, one faith, and multiple baptisms. One baptism. Just as surely as there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, just as surely as there is only one faith, and that is the faith of Jesus, there is only one baptism. Now, if there is only one baptism acceptable to God... Do you think that I'd be too far off base to say tonight that that should be the baptism with which Jesus was baptized? 
If Jesus was baptized, then that baptism would be the one baptism that Scripture refers to. So as we look at the baptism of Jesus here, in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John where? In the Jordan. In other words, in the river Jordan. Now, I've seen pictures where John is standing in the water of the Jordan River, and Jesus is on a little ledge sticking out over it, and he's kind of bent over. And John's got an abalone shell, and he's pouring water on Jesus' head. Now, how they got an abalone shell in the Jordan River, I'm not real sure about that. But you see, there's all of these false concepts that are out there. It says that he was baptized in the Jordan, and watch. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. So biblically speaking, when we look at the baptism of Jesus, Jesus went down in the water and he was baptized of John in the river. And then it says he came up out of the river. And so there we find the biblical mode of baptism. As a matter of fact, that is why John baptized where he did at the Jordan River. Notice how John puts it. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem... Notice why. Because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. He baptized there because there was much water. You've got to have much water for a biblical baptism. As a matter of fact, the word we have, the English word baptism or baptize, comes from the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo means to dip or to emerge or to plunge, to put under the water, to submerge something. For example, if a Greek sailor were sailing and his ship sank and he survived and made it to an island and was able to contact his wife back home, the message would say that the ship wrecked and baptized. It went under. So this is what true biblical baptism is really about. Baptism is putting your, being put back in the water and being buried under that water, thus a watery grave. We're going to see the great significance of that mode as we move through here tonight. At one time, all ancient churches used this method of baptism. Every church, and we'll see as we look at historically how they used this method of baptism all the way back in the first century church in Philippi, where that man is standing is an ancient baptistry. Cappadocia in Turkey also had these baptisms where people went down and were laid back in the water. I was really amazed when I was in uh, Israel and was up at the area where the Sermon on the Mount was, and there is a baptistry up there, even though it's on the Sea of Galilee. There's a baptistry probably, oh, not more than a quarter of a mile up from the Sea of Galilee. And it was used by the Christians there who weren't able to get down to the, uh, to the river or for a more... Uh, what they might have thought a more appropriate setting with the church ornate baptistry there. The city of Rome has something called the, what kind of pizza? Yeah, and this is not a pizza that you eat. This is a pizza. Okay, the leaning tower of pizza. You can see why it's called the leaning tower. But most people are not aware that within that leaning tower of pizza, it's really a baptistry. It was a baptistry built in the city of Rome where people were being baptized by being immersed under the water. But today, 
that church practices sprinkling. It's more convenient. You don't have to get wet. You don't have to change clothes. You don't have to do anything but have a little bit of water flicked in your face. We find if we even go to Russia and other places around the world, the Russian king Vladimir the Great, here is a portrait of him at his baptism in a baptistry. It was not until the 14th century that the baptism mode changed. In 1311, at the Council of Ravenna, sprinkling and pouring were now officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. So even though the Bible says one baptism, the Council of Ravenna says, oh no, we can do the other two and they're equally valid. Don't make any difference what the scripture says. So again, when we look at the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, watch this very closely. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately, where? From the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. This is what the Bible teaches about this. He saw the Spirit of God descending upon him. We read in the book of Acts about a man by the name of Philip. Philip was taken by the Holy Spirit, carried out into the wilderness over by the Gaza Strip, where there was an Ethiopian traveling, going back home after the Passover. Philip begins to walk alongside the chariot as this man is reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And after a while, Philip, one of the first Christian deacons, and also an evangelist, and also had four daughters, all of which were prophets. And Philip finally says, do you know what it is you're reading about? Do you know who that's talking about? And the Ethiopian man says, no, how would I unless somebody explained this to me? And Philip says, well, I will. So they stopped the chariot. Philip got in and sat down and gave the man a Bible study. And as they rode along, Philip explained, to this treasurer that this was talking about Jesus Christ who had just recently been crucified. And this man was already a, a Jew just up for the Passover. And so he believed all of the things of the scripture, but he didn't know who this Messiah was. And once he accepted Jesus as the Messiah, notice what happens as they traveled. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Now, do you think that this man would have been traveling in a chariot without having water with him? He's on his way back to Africa. He had water, but he needed much water, not some sprinkling. So he said, here's the water, and now watch what he says. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. The biblical mode of baptism. Both going into the water, one being laid back in the water and raised up out of the water again. Many years ago in this country, I read a story about some Indians who were uh, getting ready to leave and go to their winter grounds. And the padre that was there, there was one young boy within this tribe that had shown a great interest, and so the padre gave him a Bible to take with him. And when the boy came back uh, in the spring, after the winter camping, the little boy took the Bible to give it back to the padre, and he said, me want be baptized like in book. So the padre thought, that was great. He was elated. And he goes over to the cupboard, and he opens the cupboard, and he takes out a cup, and he goes and gets this little flask of water and begins to pour water in it, and then walks toward this young boy. And the boy has the horrified look on his face, and he begins to, to back away, and the, and the priest is now puzzled, and he says, 
W w what's wrong? And the little Indian boy said, me no fit in cup. <laughs> he wanted to be baptized like in book. You see, it means getting into the water. Now, when we look at the significance of baptism, what it is really all about, then this becomes very clear to us. Again, in Romans chapter 6, it says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? So baptism represents death, but it goes even further. It says, Therefore... We were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. It's a death, a burial, and then watch. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his what? You see, baptism represents the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We talked about this briefly the other night when people say, oh, well, we have Good Friday to commemorate the death of Jesus, and we have Easter Sunday to commemorate the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus already gave something to do both of those, and that is baptism. We are baptized unto his death. We are buried with him and we are raised to walk in newness of life. It not only commemorates the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but the death of the old man, of self, and being buried under the water, and then being raised up to walk in a new life with Jesus Christ. That's the great significance of it. You, you know, if you have a dead animal somewhere, and you see that dead animal and somebody says, oh, go bury that thing. And you go out there with a handful of dirt and throw it on it and say, you're buried. As you're not buried. Buried means to be put under something, not have something thrown in your face. You are buried with him and you walk when you rise up in a new life. You consider this mode of baptism. You're standing there and before you're put under the water, you do two things, or you better do at least these two things, at least one of them. You close your eyes, and what's the other one? You quit breathing. You quit breathing, because if you don't, you're going to come up spitting and sputtering. You close your eyes, you quit breathing, you have died. You are laid under the water, and everybody out in the congregation can be sticking their tongue out at you, thumbing their nose at you, doing whatever they want. And what do you know of it? You know nothing while you're under the water. You just have died, and you are buried. And when you come up, what's the first thing you do? You take a breath. You take a deep breath. And you now begin a new life, a life lived for Jesus Christ. And that is the great significance of baptism. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It is the death, burial, and resurrection of self to walk in a new life with him. It is death to our old sinful way of life. <clears throat> so, should a person be buried before they're dead? You know, that happened to a few people in the past. I know of a story of a, um, a very well-known man. His, this young woman got real sick, and she got worse and worse, and they finally buried her. She died. But fortunately, they didn't bury her in the ground. They, they entombed her. They put, they put her in a, in a tomb. Well, that night, as the caretaker of that cemetery was sitting there in that cemetery, he heard noises coming out of that family vault. And he got a little nervous about that, and he went to check it out, and he opened the door, and he went in, and that woman was not dead. That girl was not dead. She had, I forgot what the name of the disease was now, but many times people got buried that way back then. 
But she lived. And she grew up and she got married and she had a son by the name of Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee's mother was buried alive. You don't bury people till they're dead. And so you do not baptize people until they have died to the old way of sin. They must die to self or otherwise baptism has no significance whatsoever. Bury of the old man of your sins and raise to walk in a newness of life with Jesus Christ. Now, it's very important that we understand something about this, uh, this process here. In the book of Galatians, the third chapter and the 26th verse, watch what the Apostle Paul says. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus and if you be, if you be Christ, this is important, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So to be that, notice the first part of the passage says, you have been baptized into Christ. If you've been baptized into Christ means you have put on Christ because now you have died. And this is why the Apostle Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is what baptism represents, is that transition to where the old man is dead, that new man is the life of Christ through the Spirit of God living in the person. How important is this? It's extremely important. Watch what Jesus told Nicodemus. It's quite ironic that Nicodemus, one of the rulers of the Jews, came to the light of the world in the middle of the night so he wouldn't be seen. Didn't want to be associated with this Nazarene. And he begins to talk to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, you know, are, are you so dumb? He didn't use that word, but that's what he's saying. You are a ruler in Israel, and you don't understand these things? Here's what Jesus told him. He says, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. Does it sound like that being born of the water is as important as being born of the Spirit? He says, you cannot enter the truth or enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of the water and of the Spirit. Now, Nicodemus was a little confused. He says, you know, Jesus had told him before that you must be born again. He says, how can a man that's old enter again into his mother's womb and be born again? And that's when Jesus began to show him it's the spiritual significance of what takes place. It represents a new birth. The water represents a new birth in that Holy Spirit that will now direct you in your life. We see that um, in um, the book of Acts, this has confused some people over the years, it says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They realized that Jesus was the Messiah. These Jews who believe the rest of the Bible realized that the one that had been put to death was the Son of God. What do we do? And notice, Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of what? The Holy Spirit. This is the passage that has confused so many 
to say, well, you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And this is exactly what the apostle said. But are we going to take his condensing of what Jesus had already said in Matthew, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? So repent and be what? So what must precede baptism? Okay, and what did we see earlier must precede baptism? Teaching. You must be taught when you see the things of God and realize you've been living contrary to what the word of God says, you must 